The 80s was a great decade for the movies in general, and I have to say a lot of my all-time favourite horror comes from this time. Now, akin to my 80s sci-fi vid, I'm going to be mixing some of the less well-known cult classics with a few of the more popular films from the period. And if you've never seen one of my vids before, my name is Greg, and welcome to Channel Hyperdrive, where I try to hunt down less obvious and quirky movies by genre for film enthusiasts such as yourselves. I swallow your soul! I swallow your soul! <laughs> Swallow this. Ash Williams, a man on vacation with his girlfriend in a remote cabin in the woods, discovers an audio tape left by a college professor that contains readings from the Book of the Dead. Once played, it unleashes an onslaught of flesh-possessing demons, so when Ash's girlfriend Linda becomes possessed by one of these evil spirits, Ash is now the lone survivor with little to no hope of surviving the night. Short on story but immeasurably long on excessive gore and laughs, Sam Raimi's cult classic horror combines just the right amount of black comedy and carnage to give Evil Dead 2 a balanced amount of scares and laughs. Apart from the over-the-top blood, what really makes this horror movie stick out from similar gory films is its innovative camera work, especially its famous demonic POV shots. The classic werewolf could change shape any time it wants, day and night, whenever it takes a notion to. That's why I call them shapeshifters. I got a dozen books on it. The film follows TV journalist Karen Wright, who after a bizarre and near deadly encounter with a serial killer, is recommended by her doctor that she attend a psychiatric retreat in a remote mountain resort. But while Karen is undergoing therapy, her co-worker Chris discovers there's something supernatural linked to her shock and that the residents may not be what they seem. A monster film done right and one of those rare werewolf flicks that are actually good. The Howling has a decent balanced mix of comedy, paranoia and eeriness, giving the audience an unsettling yet entertaining experience. The film's pacing is a bit slow in places, especially the first act, and some of the acting can be awkwardly funny at times. That being said, for an 80s movie, the practical effects are excellent and the actual story is pretty good. If you love an American werewolf in London or like werewolf movies in general, then check The Howling out. After one of her friends mysteriously dies in her dreams, Nancy Thompson quickly learns that her terrifying dreams of a disfigured man attacking her might be more than just a typical nightmare. With no one else really taking her seriously, will Nancy, with the help of her useless boyfriend Johnny Depp, solve this baffling puzzle before she falls asleep? Wes Craven's extremely original and creative horror, A Nightmare on Elm Street's Tormentor Freddy Krueger by appearance alone is enough to give most people's nightmares. But in addition to the idea of a supernatural murderer attempting to take your life, he only tries to kill you in your dreams, which when you think about it is a pretty terrifying thought. And I think that's what really makes this horror movie stand out from so many others. It's the genius and the simplicity of its premise. If you fall asleep, you'll die. <laughs> I'd like to see him get in here now. When the diva of an opera has an accident, her understudy, a young woman called Betty, reluctantly replaces her. But as soon as she starts rehearsals, Betty becomes stalled by a deranged masked phantom, involving her in a series of murders with the people she holds dearest. So who might this killer be, and why are they so obsessed with tormenting this young singer? Probably Dario Argento's most underrated movie, opera is a thoroughly nasty horror filled with the director's trademarks, such as his use of colour, long POV shots and over-the-top gory scenes. Now I want to address the white elephant in the room in regards to the dub for this movie, as it is so bad it's good. Well done Betty, you're so beautiful! I mean, if you can get your hands on a copy of the original Italian version, it is a completely different film. However, I actually prefer the dub as it has me giggling throughout the entire film. <laughs> Now, to say that any of this movie is somewhat silly and unrealistic would be an understatement, but it doesn't take away from the overall fun, yet disturbing experience. Please stop! Get away from him! You just stay away from him! He's just a little boy! <laughs> Teenage brothers Michael and Sam move with their mum to Santa Carla, California, a small town with the reputation of being the murder capital of the world. When the younger brother Sam makes friends with a pair of would-be vampire hunters, ironically, the older brother Michael falls for a local girl called Star who turns out to belong to a local gang of vampires. With Michael now sleeping throughout the day and staying out all night, Sam fears that his big brother may have become a creature of the night. With clothes, hair and teen angst that's so 80s you either feel nostalgia or bemusement, The Lost Boys is an excellent combination of horror and humour that results in a unique take on the vampire genre. 
that seamlessly shifts tone from comedy to horror without any disruption. Death by Stereo. The cast is iconic, including Kiefer Sutherland, who really stands out with his excellent performance. The practical effects are first rate, and all the characters are either menacing, funny, or complete oddballs. If you like vampire movies that don't take themselves too seriously, then this is one that you will not want to miss. When a cowboy called Caleb meets a gorgeous yet mysterious woman at a bar, the two have an immediate yet strong attraction towards each other. But when he's bitten on the neck, their relationship gets a little complicated as Caleb is forced to leave his family when he's afflicted with a craving for human blood. Stuck with a gang of vampires, Caleb must decide between his new love and the love of his family. With three members of the cast from Aliens, it's kind of strange how near dark is almost unheard of nor commented on, as this is kind of like a redneck version of The Lost Boys, but instead of a comedy, you get more violence and realism. That being said, I can see how this film is not to everyone's tastes, as it doesn't play by all the standard vampire rules. Near Dark is a one-of-a-kind horror that was good enough to hold my curiosity to the end. It can be a little bit swing and miss, as its first act is pretty uneventful, but as I'm a fan of Bill Paxton, vampire flicks and 80s movies, this for me was a pleasant flick to stumble upon. <laughs> Go check it out. <laughs> Jack Torrance aka Jack Nicholson is an inspiring writer who becomes an off-season caretaker of an isolated hotel in the hopes of curing his writer's block, bringing along his wife Wendy and son Danny, a child plagued by psychic premonitions. With Jack's writing going nowhere and Danny's visions becoming more and more disturbing, alone in the Colorado mountains will Jack finally cure his writer's block or will he find something more productive to do with his beloved family? Stanley Kubrick's excellent adaptation of Stephen King's novel is a chilling adventure into the growing insanity of caretaker Jack Torrance. After watching it several times, this is one of those movies that can still build a ton of tension even though you know exactly what's going to happen next. That's probably due to the scarily realistic acting and horrific chemistry between Duvall's and Nicholson's characters. While I'm sure fans of the novel might not like Kubrick's changes to the plot, the haunting and unique visuals alone should be enough to at least sway most people into admitting that this is easily one of the best made horror films of all time. Mother, if that's Melanie, Mother, if that's Melanie, tell her the monkey's here. Tell her to come here right away. When a young athlete called Alan Mann becomes paralyzed after he has the bricks knocked out of him by a truck, to help Alan in his failing to adjust to a quadriplegic lifestyle, his best friend Jeffrey, a scientist who experiments with monkeys by injecting them with human brains, has an ingenious idea to have one of these experimental brain monkeys look after his friend. With absolutely nothing weird going on with this setup, what could possibly go wrong with such a great idea? George A. Romero's Monkey Shines, considering its villain, is one of those so bad it's good films that it takes itself far too seriously. In my opinion, it should have been treated more like a comedy with elements of horror rather than a straight up horror flick, as the film goes from a Disney-like family comedy to something pretty dark at the flick of a switch. Sure, it's got some pretty cool transitions and I love the originality of the story, but Romero really does try too hard to make the monkey scary. I mean, all the thunder and lightning in the world is not going to stop this little fella from being cute, even when it's off to murder someone. Monkey Shines is a very slow paced and utterly ridiculous movie, yet I still find it very entertaining for many, many odd reasons. If you'd like to see more videos that focus on less well-known or underappreciated films, then head over to my Patreon page to help fund the channel where I give channel updates and upload other things like custom 4K posters of my thumbnails. I've also got a store where I've been designed some cool movie related merch such as posters, mugs, t-shirts and other similar stuff. Either way, uh, check out one of the links below and I'll see you over in the next video.